And for updates on the domestic commodities market, I'm being joined by the head of research at Financial Derivatives Company, Damilola Akimbami. Hello, Dami. Good, Good to morning, see you. Chimizzi. Good morning. All right, let's kick off with your burning economic issues. Oh, we'll see here the federal government raising alarm over low level of internally generated revenue by state governments and has declared Katsina, Kebi, Borno, Bielsa, and Taraba states as insolvent. What's the implications of this? Yes, so these five states have been termed insolvent, so basically they are poor, and that's mm. because of um, um, they, were, they collected um, low levels of um, IGL. And what this means is that clearly these states don't have the funds to even provide the necessary stimulus to um, boost economic activity levels in these states. And what it means is that obviously they won't be able to meet the outstanding obligations and they'll be in need of a bailout. So the government, the federal government, might need to step in to actually bail out these states. Do you you think they would have they would want to do that at this time when uh, I mean they are looking for money so that, that's a challenge definitely <laughs> because the, the government too as a whole is needs um, or is looking for funds to basically um, boost the economy so it's it's something that definitely they're going to look into and if you look at these five states um, apart from Kebi and Bono that have unemployment rates below 20 percent the, the other three have high unemployment rates so it could also be a reason to ex as to why um, these states are actually reporting low IGR and again most of the states are in the north apart from Bielsa and we know that the north has been um, started with a lot of insecurity which has led to the, the, um, the displacement of farmers, the displacement of people outside those states. So these are some of the reasons that have um, contributed to this low IGR. The, de the government definitely might need to step in to, um, to, to save, in quote, these states. And we know that even the federal allocation um, funds that were shared this month, they inched up marginally thanks to at least relatively stable oil prices and some improvement in VAT collection. But if there's a change in the market fundamentals and we start to see the monthly statutory allocations decline, mm. obviously the government may not have sufficient buffers to help these states in need. Now, is there any implications for food security? Yes, for food security, again, like I mentioned, because of the insecurity that is happening in the north, most um, farmers have had to leave their, um, their farmlands. And because of the low economic activity level and the north being the food hub mm. of the country, definitely to affect um, food supply, and that could lead to um, higher prices for um, food commodities. Okay, now the CBN has announced a new price verification exercise for imports. Wondering why this is coming now, I, I thought we, we have pre-shipping inspection. What happens you know, to this? So what the CBN is trying to do is basically to avoid over-invoicing. And what we've seen is of late is like, a lot, because usually people that are importing goods from overseas, they, they go through third parties, they use buying so agents. So are they going to scrap the pre-shipping inspection? Yes, so one of the circulars released also yesterday in addition to the price verific verification scheme the CBN wants to start is basically they've told um, importers that if you're going to bring, if you're going to, if you're going to raise a form M, you are going to ha have to do it directly in, f in favor of the end um, supplier. So you're not going to go through um, third parties. So the, the CBN is basically pushing out um, third parties and also the price Price verification to avoid invoicing. So if the it, it, if it costs one thousand dollars to bring in a certain amount of goods, it's going to be one thousand dollars. So that over invoicing basically to reduce the price. So if the price reduces, the CBN is of the opinion that the demand for forex to be reduced. So the CBN is just trying to implement as much measures as possible to complement its forex ra ration scheme. But for you, do you think this is really the right step to really take at this time? Oh, well, the CBN, like I mentioned, is trying so many um, measures, but the main thing is that you know, the volume or the uh, amount of forex in supply needs to be improved because we've talked about um, the fact that we need stimulus um, packages to boost economic activity. Nigeria is highly import dependent, so these manufacturers need to have access to forex to be able to bring in the necessary raw materials to stimulate um, output and growth. So the CBN is just looking for all sorts of measures to do. So it might come what is going on right now but then you need to improve supply and it might also lead to an adjustment in price that has a short-term pain of higher um, food prices which might lead to inflation but as long as aggregate output increases at the end of the day it would suppress prices okay all right let's look at the GDP numbers what is the implication of these numbers for the commodities uh, market space we saw negative growth 
like in trade, manufacturing, construction, you know, and we just talked about transportation mm -hmm. now. Yes, so, well, first of all, the numbers didn't come as a surprise. And again, Nigeria is not the only um, country recording mm. negative growth. We have the U.S. with minus 32% growth rate in Q2, Germany about 18%, um, even mm. the U.K. about minus 20% um, um, growth rate. So it's not an unusual thing, although it's not a race to the bottom. Now, with that said, if you look at in terms of this sector's contribution to GDP, so you have agriculture, industries, and services, those are the three broad categories. It's interesting to note that that out of these three, only agriculture's oh. share of contribution increased. Mm. So services, despite being, still being the largest contributor to GDP, its share reduced, industry still reduced. So that, that, that is actually a good thing. It's a positive um, um, fact in the sense that all the four indicators or sub-activities under the agriculture sector are still in positive territory. So you have um, the likes of fishing and livestock actually reporting a faster growth rate. Meanwhile, um, crop production and forestry recorded a, sl um, a slower pace of growth, but all four sub-activities are still in positive territory. So that's a good thing because, again, we just talked about food inflation. We're in the harvest season, but we're still seeing food prices still relatively sticky downwards. They're still high, and that's because the level of rainfall, at least towards this side of Nigeria, has been, has been low. We expected that by now we should see more rains occurring, which would impact positively on the harvest season. But we're not seeing that yet. So the harvest season might not be as robust as anticipated, and that definitely would impact on food prices. But with that said, the fact that agriculture was still one of the sectors that was able to weather the COVID impact storm to an extent, I think is a positive note. And as economic activity levels pick up, now that we know that the international flights are going to reopen August 29. We're seeing uh, more activity levels pick up. We're seeing more restaurants, more, more sectors of the economy resume activity levels. I think that would impact positively on, um, on the growth numbers on commodities. In other words, you say that um, the government intervention in that um, sector has paid off, like the anchor borrowers. The, the government's intervention in that sector has paid off, and with that sector has been one of the major beneficiaries of all the reforms that both the government from the fiscal side and the central bank have been implementing. But even overall, if you look at the total stimulus package of the economic sustainability plan of 2.3 trillion naira, that is just about 20% of the total contraction in GDP. So yes, the government is doing the right things, but in terms of quantum, in terms of magnitude, we have barely scratched the surface. So the government needs to inject more funds into the system as soon as possible, coupled with the monetary policy we just talked about, the forex supply that needs to be um, beefed up. This will definitely impact positively on the level of economic activity in the country. Now, the oil sector, of course, we've seen recorded a decline of 6.63%, uh, uh, contributing just 8.9% um, uh, to the uh, GDP. Of course, production is currently down. What is the implication of this for revenue? Yes, so all sector, the contribution is minute, just about up approximately 9%. But in terms of the impact on revenue, it's significant because Nigeria receives over 80% of its forex receipts, of its revenue from oil. And the oil market has been volatile of, of recent, though oil prices are at least above $44, they're trading about $45 right now per barrel. Nigeria's oil production, however, has been declining. It's at 1.49 million barrels per day now, as at July, according to OPEC monthly um, oil market report and now that OPEC is clamping down on the oil cheaters in quote ensuring mm. that this the compliance level is beefed up to 100% Nigeria will be forced to reduce further its oil production to its quota of 1.4. And that is significant for us, like I mentioned, because of the implications on revenue, well, revenue yeah. or implications on forex. We're talking about trying to beef up um, a forex supply but if the major source is being um, constrained, it will definitely affect the ability of the government to intervene where necessary. Now, with the tax revenue rising, should it, is there something for us to cheer? Now? Yes, so the government too is trying to diversify its revenue mm -hmm. base. So that's why you're seeing more focus, increased focus of the government towards non oil sector activities. Mm -hmm. And right now, we've seen that tax revenue, thanks to the increase in the VAT rate from 5% to 7.5 mm -hmm. in February, we're seeing that. But more importantly, is the improved collection process. Because you can increase your tax rate, but if there's still inefficiencies Absolutely. in the collection process, you're not going to achieve 
achieve that much. So mm -hmm. we're definitely seeing improved collection process, and that is what is um, resulting into the increase in tax revenue. So if we have more tax revenue, more VAT, more custom duties, more um, PPT, petroleum profit tax, that will complement or offset the loss that is being recorded in the oil sector. All right, let's look through the domestic price movement and their major drivers. Can you okay. take us through that? Okay, so for the domestic um, commodity prices, like I mentioned, as in prices are still relatively mixed right now. So, and, and that's because, again, harvest season, one would expect increased um, rainfall to impact positively on that, but we're yet to see that. But I want to believe that at least once the, the rains resume, we should see um, food prices start to soften. But another factor that is affecting food prices is transportation costs. So we know that the, um, the pump price of petrol has increased. We know that there's a lot of construction going on. We know that the third Milan bridge has been closed for at least six months. So this definitely are feeding into the logistics and distribution costs and that also impacting on prices. So as if that's like the fact that we, we are expecting to see a pick up in the supply of food, but as long as these challenges, these supply disruptions still um, persist, they may offset whatever um, gains we would see in an improvement in food supply. All right, thank you very much, uh, Damilola, for your time. Thank you, Chimizi. Damilola Kimba is, is the head of research at Financial Derivatives um, Company. We'll take a moment, we'll be back.